Hey everyone, thanks for joining me for another devlog for Dauphin, my 2D RPG about a marine biologist trying to save the ocean and its inhabitants. Today is Saturday, April 9th. I know we're a little ways out from the last episode, but I promise that's not without good reason. I've had a bit of a new distraction over the past two weeks, and that distraction is named Moose. Moose is a now 10-week-old golden doodle, the first dog I have ever owned, and an absolutely adorable and lovable handful. My wife and I have been dreaming about getting a puppy for years, and now that we live in our cozy house with its little fenced-in backyard, it was finally time. It has certainly been an adjustment to my routine to give this little guy all the attention he deserves, but it's been a great experience so far, and even with him in the picture, development of Dauphin has moved forward. In the last episode, we took the first steps towards overhauling Dauphin's combat system, mostly through the creation of new animations and a more dynamic way of using the quote-unquote weapons that the player finds in the world. And I say that because our weapons are no longer blunt force implements like the old bronze sword, but instead kind of magical items that each have a unique way to help clear corruption from organisms. Y'all seem to really like this new direction in the comments, and I received some great feedback on how to continue to tweak these mechanics to make combat feel a bit more weighty and satisfying. Implementing that feedback is where I'm going to start today before tackling the bigger objective this week of finally implementing underwater combat. I want to give Riddler a quick shout out for their feedback on that last video. They commented three quick tweaks that could help improve the feel of swinging the coral wand. First, speed up the animation. Second, only activate collision at the frame that represents the apex of the swing. And finally, make the slash a bit bigger. Those seem like some very reasonable and quick changes to me, so I'm going to try and knock those out now while Moose is snoozing and try to work out a plan for the rest of the evening and weekend. Alright, got those changes wrapped up, which thankfully didn't take too long. You may have noticed from that footage that all I really did was lengthen my slash attack sprite, move the transition to that apex frame closer to the beginning of the animation, and only enable collision when we move to that frame. The result is not something you can probably see very well, but does indeed feel better on my end from a gameplay perspective. This is one of those things that will need more tweaking after people start using it for the first time, so I'm happy to leave it there for now and move on. I hear the pup stirring downstairs, so I'm going to go bother him, and assuming he knocks out again this evening, either come back up here for more development or maybe just some downtime. In any case, we'll catch up soon to begin the implementation of underwater combat. Hey everyone, welcome back to Sunday Afternoon. It's been a pretty productive day so far. Spent some time training Moose, ran some errands, got a workout in, and now settling in for some development time. As I mentioned yesterday, the goal today is to get started on underwater combat. Thankfully, I took care of all those animations for the player in the previous episode, so for me the hardest part is done. What remains is the code, and more specifically, a new underwater attack state for the player that knows how to accept input to trigger these new animations and the attacks associated with the equipped weapon. This should all be pretty similar to the above water attack state, so I'm hoping it goes pretty smoothly. Hey y'all, so update here on Monday morning. As it turns out, and I shouldn't be surprised, this is more complicated than I thought it might be. As I mentioned before, my plan was to create a new state for underwater combat, or even just modify the existing attack state to play the correct animations based on whether or not the player was underwater. Both of these approaches unfortunately have a fatal flaw in that they require a transition away from the player dive state. The dive state is where everything important to diving takes place. We monitor air supply, perform swimming movements and animations, and manage transitions out of the water. If we leave this state to go to an attack state instead, all that goes out the window, meaning for example when the player is swinging their weapon underwater, their air supply will no longer be dwindling. So that's just really not going to work. What this means for me is a refactor of my dive state. In hindsight, the dive state should really have just been a swim state, with all of the other underwater management code being abstracted above the state machine since multiple states might rely on it. For now though, it is time for work, but I'll be back soon to clean this up. Alright y'all, back on a rainy Monday evening here. Unfortunately not the same Monday, but a whole week later. As you might imagine, I've had to experiment with some tweaks to my routine now that Moose is in the picture, and last week I did not do a very good job of finding balance. 
Unsurprisingly, I do not have time to lift six days a week in the morning, take care of the dog, and work on dolphin. So I'm going to be cutting back to every other day on the workouts. The good news is the moose has me doing more cardio anyway, so I think that'll be a reasonable adjustment. In the meantime, I have made some important progress on underwater combat. You can see that we're looking at a brand new class here called the Player Underwater Controller. And this is where all of the code previously in my player dive state that has to do with the player swimming underwater now lives. So everything from keeping track of the player's air supply, tracking their depth and their depth penalty, basically everything except for the actual swimming animations and the movement now lives in this player underwater controller, which is not part of the state machine. To go along with that, here's what's left of the player dive state. This obviously used to be a very huge file, but we're all the way down to 50 lines now. And all this really has to do is look at the player's stats to determine exactly how fast the player can swim and perform those swimming animations. So pretty simple now. By separating out this logic between these two classes, I was able to take effectively the first stab at executing my first underwater attacks. If you're actually doing that from left to right here, it doesn't look too bad. The player actually swings that wand with the new underwater swimming animations. And of course, the actual position of the slash here needs some work, but the animations themselves don't look too bad. Where this really starts to break down is if you try to swing below, which really just doesn't look like it makes a lot of sense here. And same if you try to swing above. So this is gonna require, unfortunately, some rework for these animations. And honestly, I'd like to hear some feedback as to how you think I could kind of orient the player to make these swings look a little more natural. I'm gonna put some more thought into that myself and in the meantime, work on a little side test that came up as I was working on breaking up my dive state. I kind of realized that there is a lot that changes when the player is above water versus below the surface. And it was feeling a bit hacky to change the behavior in each of my states based on a Boolean flag that tells me when the player is underwater. What I think makes more sense is creating a second state machine, one for when the player is above water, controlling running, normal attacks, fishing, climbing, etc., and one for when the player is underwater that controls swimming, custom attack animations, and more. This will also give me the opportunity to make a few long-standing tweaks to my state machine system. So I'm going to dive in probably tomorrow morning and hit the refactor. Welcome back to Thursday morning, just as I'm rounding out improvements to my state management system. It should come as no surprise that my implementation plans changed a bit once I started to get more into the weeds. It turns out that having two state machines was not going to clean up my code very much. Instead of checking to see if the player was underwater in a given state or before selecting a new state, I'd have to check if the player was underwater before even deciding which state machine to request a state from. So the takeaway is that we're back to a single state machine, but while I was in there messing around, I made some really nice improvements to how new states are requested. Previously, I was kind of requesting new states from the state machine all over the place, from within the player class, individual states themselves, and even in totally random classes like my dialogue manager, in which I was requesting the idle state when a new dialogue popped up. As you can imagine, that can make issues dealing with incorrect state really hard to debug. To solve this, I'm working towards a new system that utilizes signals kind of as the events of a more formal state machine. In previous places in my code where I was requesting a new state from the state machine, I now emit a signal that describes what just happened that could result in a state change. For my previous example, that could be when a dialog appears. So here in my dialog manager code, I now broadcast that out. These new signals are being captured within my new player state machine, which extends my base state machine class. This new subclass has knowledge of all the player's available states and the rules that govern transitions between them. Down at the bottom of this class, I have a section dedicated to handling these newly broadcasted events that the state machine might care about. So you can see here that when a dialogue begins, we request the idle state. Another example below is when we receive movement input from within the idle state, we request a transition to the move state. Having a more centralized place to respond to events and request the appropriate state makes all of the player's behaviors much easier to manage. It has also helped me remove sketchy code from a number of other classes that shouldn't really need to care about the state machine at all. So overall, I think this was a great refactor. With that done, it's time to shift focus back to the swim and attack states to clean up their interactions and improve the player's underwater attack animations. I do have an idea for how to do that, but it is now time for work, so we'll have to catch up soon. Hey everyone, welcome back to Saturday morning. It's about 8.30 here and I just got caught up on this devlogs editing all the way up to this point, so I'm excited to kick off a day of development today and hopefully have this ready to go for tomorrow. 
As you know, I'm working on my underwater attacks this morning. What I'm considering changing to make those look better are my animations when the player is swimming up and down. Instead of this current behavior, I'm thinking I'll just borrow the player's animations for swimming left and right and rotate those to point the player up or down. That might end up looking a little bit weird, but I know it will at least help with the attack animations, so we'll start there. Unfortunately, I now have a quick errand to run that I need to mow the lawn, so I'll be back soon to get this underway. Quick update here just after 1.30 in the afternoon, and y'all please ignore my scratchy voice. My allergies almost killed me while I was mowing the lawn. So I've been playing around with rotating my existing underwater attack animations, which you can see right here. This is the normal one, and what I've been doing both kind of programmatically in the engine and also manually here in Ace Sprite is trying to rotate this in particular upwards so that when the player is kind of generating an upwards attack, we have an animation that more closely matches that. As you can see, this just does not look very good. The neck is craned back in like this really awkward position, and I just don't think it would actually look very good in practice, and it even seems like you wouldn't be able to generate like a lot of strength or power in this kind of strange position. So unfortunately, I think this isn't gonna work. As I was thinking about how to make this look more natural and also reuse some of my existing movements here in my animation file, I realized it might make more sense for the player to kind of be on their back swinging the weapon across their chest, kind of rolled onto their back with their head facing up towards the surface. So that's what I ended up landing on as a new upwards attack animation for swimming underwater. And that's what we see here. Obviously it's really just kind of the standing slash animation that I rotated in this case counterclockwise. I think this will look pretty good once the player is kind of wearing flippers and their dive gear, kind of as if they've rolled onto their back to face the surface and swing a weapon. I think this is going to be a better alternative to what we just looked at. To go along with this, I also have new downward facing animations. So to illustrate that, here is kind of our left facing normal attack where we swing across our body. And then to go along with that now, we can face downwards and swing. I think seeing those two things side by side looks just a little bit better than the alternative of rotating those existing animations. I am going to move forward with these for now, but I'd love to hear what you guys think down in the comments. This is definitely a big challenge for me to get these animations right. With all these animations ready to go in a sprite, it's time to export a new sprite sheet and get it all hooked up in the engine. So we'll check back once I get that done. All right, y'all, welcome back to 5 p.m. on Saturday evening. I've hit kind of a necessary stopping point both to give my brain a break and to give me time to put this devlog together for tomorrow. Unfortunately, this cutoff has left me with a rather buggy implementation of my new animations, but most of the meat's there, so I figure we should take a look. So here we are in our underwater scene here, and this is going to be a very basic and very buggy kind of representation of these new animations, but hopefully you can get the idea of generally what they look like. And to be honest, I'm still on the fence. I'd love to hear what you guys think about this. So we can still attack on the right and left side as normal, again with some of the weird issues with these animations resetting. But when we start to click above the player, we'll see the player flip over. So his head is still on the left side here, but when he flips over, we're actually attacking towards the top. And the same is true with the bottom. He'll kind of point his head down on the left side here if our mouse is low enough, and that will trigger an attack down on the bottom. That's of course the same as well with the right side. So we can attack upwards and downwards on the right side. So this is just maybe a little bit better way to attack in all four primary directions here. Seeing this in practice, I can already tell it's gonna need some more tweaking, but that's okay. I'm confident with time I can land on some attack animations that finally look a bit more natural and fluid. I'll also maybe mention that I was considering removing those upward and downward facing underwater attacks altogether. Given the perspective switch from top down to side on when we're underwater, that might actually make more sense and really simplify things for me. Thank you all for sticking around and for your patience as I try to keep forging ahead on Dauphin with this handful of fur nipping at my ankles. As time goes on, I know I'll be able to further tweak my routines to resume some normalcy. I want to give a special shout out to all the folks who support Dauphin's development and this channel on Patreon. Grammy supporters this month are Cody Odin, Finifu Games, Mega Ombre, James Kennedy, Jess Sargo, Binary Chef, Elena, Dan, and Kyle Van Riper. Beta supporters are Vlad Sunny, Deluse, Happy Hippie, Stein Dusseldorp, and Nifty Pixel. 
Thank you all so much for watching. Stay safe, and I will see you in the next episode.